often think of uh, as that coherent, but um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited to um, be a part of the RCC and to get to know all the people at the Land House who are all great um, and everyone else here. And I'm really thankful for, your, uh, for you all to, to have me and um, listen to my, about my work. So um, my, I'm kind of presenting on my dissertation topic. It's called The Poetics of the Los Angeles River. It's a mix. I would say of comparative cultural studies, um, urban geography, environmental criticism, um, and I'm in an English department. But as you know, as per my introduction, I kind of like doing a lot of different things. Um, and when I moved to LA, I was really fascinated by the LA River and the sort of collision of nature and urbanism in the city. Um, and I started to learn more about the LA River and realize um, that it's this really kind of singularly um, sort of significant um, site of experimentation and conflict around um, the issue of green urbanism um, and kind of the, the nature culture question more generally. So I'm going to read from my script, um, but I'm, yeah, thanks for listening, and I hope you um, find something sort of salient here. So this is the Los Angeles River extending 51 miles from the San Fernando Valley in the north to the port of Long Beach in the south. It was the original water source for the Los Angeles region, sustaining indigenous Tongva communities, 18th century Spanish colonists, early 19th century Mexican residents, and US occupants of the emerging metropolis. Both a life-giving source and a flood threat, the river proved crucial to, a 19th, to 19th century irrigation and development, nourishing the orange groves and vineyards that helped define the image of the region as a paradise-like refuge for the, from the industrializing eastern United States. By the early 20th century, however, the river could no longer support the city's growing population. It served as a dumping ground for trash and dead animals and developed a reputation as an environmentally and cultu culturally marginalized space. When the Los Angeles Aqueduct opened in 1913, pumping unprecedented quantities of water from central California to LA, it sealed the fate of the LA River as a vestigial water source and flood prone menace. Slick paved streets and growing urban density intensified the risk. Following a series of catastrophic floods in the 1930s, the US Army Corps of Engineers embarked on a massive infrastructural effort to channelize the river, cast it in concrete, to serve as a drain for the entire watershed. In this slide, you can see the progression from natural river to concrete ditch. Image one shows a relatively untouched river in the 19th century. Image two shows the river's power to upend the city's infrastructures. Image three shows the post-war channelization process intersecting with the construction of LA's notorious freeway system. And image four shows the river much as it is today with a low flow channel to accommodate everyday runoff and a vast bed to dispense with the furious rains that sporadically unsettle the dry semi-arid floodplain. Lasting until 1960, the channelization process epitomized modernist efforts to control and reshape the natural world. The brutalist concrete style confirms this goal, transforming an unruly, an unruly river into a technocratic tool for urban growth. Whereas the 1930 Olmsted Bartholomew Plan proposed the river as a citywide green space with miles of parkland to absorb floodwaters, the Army Corps solution foreclosed this pastoral possibility, just as it reinforced the racial and economic divisions between East and West LA. The channel largely fulfilled its flood control purpose. It also flushed increasingly precious fresh water out to sea. It's perhaps unsurprising that this pileup of natural and cultural collisions has attracted a great deal of attention. The river plays the role of desolate no man's land in films such as Point Blank, Grease, To Live and Die in LA, and Terminator 2. After years as a punchline or afterthought, the river came to prominence in the 1980s among environmentalists, politicians, and planners, each speculating on the uses of post-industrial urban space. 
Since then, scholars such as Jennifer Wolk and Matthew Gandy and public historians such as Mike Davis and Jenny Price have focused on the river as an emblem of LA urbanization and a lodestar for meaningful change. Three LA River master plans later, as water politics become increasingly dire in the southwestern US, the waterway has solidified its outsized reputation, symbolizing both the promises and perils of green urbanism. Now the river serves as a stage for intersecting concerns from climate preparedness to green gentrification to environmental justice to the enduring affordances of thinking global and acting local. My project, The Poetics of the Los Angeles River, addresses these wide-ranging issues through an alternative history, focusing on the diverse tradition of art making on the river since the 1970s. Each step of the way, artists anticipated the LA River debate, establishing the layers of concern that have reshaped this natural cultural waterway. My project hinges on a few key questions. What is the role of the arts in reimagining urban nature? How can we reimagine re re urban nature to both foreground environmental justice and nourish a genuinely sustainable ecosystem? And how might local and regional interventions uh, model more expansive possibilities? Here, I emphasize the imagination because of the scope of the task at hand, not simply rebuilding an outmoded infrastructure, but overturning the governing logic that underwrites urban space. I'm thinking of poetics as in poetry, that is the symbolically rich literary genre, and poetics as in poesis, the Greek for making, looking to the potential within the arts for river making and world making. I wanna take a minute to explain my conceptual approach. I call this project a situated theory of art in place, situated because its lessons emerge out of specific social, political, and economic conditions in Southern California. In theory, because I suggest these local concerns have far, a far-reaching resonance. I look at the ways that artists have negotiated design strategies and coalition building in the city. The river offers a scene and a metaphor for this tension between solidarity and difference. It is both concrete and water, fluid and fixed. Here I extend recent critical interest in archipelagos, drawing on Martinetian theorist Edouard Glissant's work on opacity, relation, and power across cultures. For Glissant, the legacies of colonial violence brought an undeniable hybridity of cultures as well as distinct and often irreconcilable perspectives. I am partial to a line from his book, Caribbean Discourse, where he writes, our landscape is its own monument. Its meaning can only be traced on the underside. I take this to mean that the overarching currents of modernity may imply a coherent picture of the world, but the, this picture conceals an uneven relational patchwork of histories and ways of knowing. Rather than looking at islands as figures of exchange, I focus on urban space, with the river as a link from the local and land-based to the oceanic and planetary. I am interested in the river's underside as a site of poetry and meaningful political change. Each of my chapters focuses on a different cultural discourse along the river including Chicana muralism, avant-garde poetry, conceptual art, and graffiti. Each engages a key work or works, highlighting diverse political and environmental perspectives. Altogether, these narratives suggest an urban environmental commons based in both difference and collaboration. I view these chapters as tributaries, starting in separate places but converging on the central figure of the Los Angeles River. As an interdisciplinary method, I'm looking to everyday spaces as a framework for thinking across disciplinary divides. There's been a tremendous amount of artwork made on or about the LA River, and it's not a linear history. To manage this fragmentary tradition, I have chosen artworks that stand on their own as case studies uh, for reimagining urban nature, and together offer what Walter Mignolo, via the Zapatistas, would call a pluriversal view of the LA River a quote, world in which many worlds fit. 
As such, I will not attempt a comprehensive overview of art, the art of the LA River. Instead, I will describe each of these four tributaries along the borderlines, uh, interacting along the borderlines of natural, cultural, public space. Judy Baca's The Great Wall of Los Angeles is the first major LA River artwork. Baca is a significant figure for, of the Chicano and Chicana art movement of the 1970s, which sought artistic expressions for the, the, excuse me, for the liberation and political agency of Mexican-American Mexican people in East LA and elsewhere in the United States. Baca's work as a muralist blends social critique and community practice, an approach that critic Ana Indich Lopez calls her, quote, public art of contestation. Created between 1976 and 1983 with a huge cast of collaborators, the Great Wall of Los Angeles spans a half mile of the concrete to Hungawash tributary and tells a history of California from the perspective of marginalized groups. Each 100 foot panel focuses in on a significant moment, adding up to a counter narrative of dissent. The story reaches back to the prehistoric and then the pre-colonial era and highlights both broad historical trends such as the racial and colonial dimensions of the California citrus industry and more discrete and emblematic events such as the city's appropriation of the Mexican-American Chavez Ravine in the 1950s to make way for the LA Dodgers baseball stadium seen here as a spaceship invading from above. The first several plant panels were designed collaboratively, but in the second summer of production, Baca took over, utilizing a dynamic, multi-point compositional perspective to convey a sense of historical change. My reading of The Great Wall attends to these discrete muralistic scenes, as well as the stakes of depicting such an oppositional history on a waterway that represents modernity's transformation of the natural landscape. While the Great Wall is typically viewed as a grand social critique, a correction to dominant narr narratives of power, I suggest it is also an environmental work produced at the same time as many canonical land art pieces that take the earth itself as material. Unlike more abstract land-based sculptures like Michael Heiser's enormous cliffside cut piece, Double Negative, however, the Great Wall insists on the historically specific entanglement of social and environmental concerns. In this way, it suggests an environmental current within the Chicano art movement and anticipates the environmental justice movement, which took root in the US in the 1980s. The next tributary follows the career of poet and environmentalist Lewis McAdams, whose nonprofit organization Friends of the Los Angeles River began in 1985 as a performance art piece and has significantly shaped the political and policy agenda along the waterway. There he is holding a copy of his last poetry collection, The River, um, which is sort of a reflection on his time working in Los Angeles. In the 1960s, McAdams participated in the celebrated New York-based poetry community known as the New York School before moving to the poet's enclave of Bolinas, California in the early 70s. Bolinas attracted, attracted attention for its literary community as well as for its collective response to a massive 1971 oil spill off the nearby coast of San Francisco. McAdams took up environmental journalism and policy writing in addition to poetry after the spill and organized to reject a US Army Corps sewerage proposal with his Art Meets planning group, the Bolinas Future Studies Center. In this early phase, McAdams drew connections between poetry and infrastructure, his world-shaping forces that link the near and the far and weave in and out of enclosed spaces. McAdams moved to Los Angeles in the late 1970s and encountered the LA River while working a construction job downtown. In time, he would write about the river and crucially address it as a in a performance artwork. 
1985 piece titled Friends of the Los Angeles River involved an illicit walk up the channel as well as a theatrical spectacle in which McAdams, dressed as infamous LA water engineer William Mulholland, performed, quote, the first act of a 40-year artwork to bring the Los Angeles River back to life through a combination of art, politics, and magic. Friends of the Los Angeles River, the performance piece, would soon become Friends of the Los Angeles River, the upstart environmentalist group. Soon, McAdams caught the attention of activists, politicians, planners, and community organizations. And the project, in the briefest terms, became a hub for the still ongoing debates about the future of the LA River, its social space, natural resource, and vector of power. Though steeped in bureaucracy, McAdams centered himself in the arts. Quote, by calling Friends of the Los Angeles River a 40-year artwork, I hope to fortify us against impatience and frustration and cynicism, end quote. I suggest that this durational artwork echoes collectivist calls for urban transformation, such as Henri Lefebvre's concept of the right to the city, which casts urban space as a use value in oeuvre or a work of art. McAdams then proposed a right to the river, putting poetic and environmentalist ideas in conversation with radical urbanism. So I'm kind of giving you a sort of chapter by chapter um, description of my project, but I wanted to create this sense of how all of these different um, narratives kind of feed into the same set of um, ideas. My third tributary consists of the extravagant eco-art of husband-wife duo Helen Meyer Harrison and Newton Harrison. The Harrisons got their start as conceptualists in the 1960s, but their focus soon shifted squarely to ecological crisis and the concept of survival. While influential, influential in their time, the, Har the Harrisons are no longer very well known. However, their 50-year collaboration is an epic engagement with ecology across scales and a sometimes quixotic, sometimes breathtaking blurring of art, landscape, architecture, environmental science, poetry, and urban planning. Their grand statement, The Lagoon Cycle, produced between 1974 and 1984, for example, begins as an effort to harvest a hardy species of Sri Lankan crab in their backyard and scales out to consider the ethics of regional geoengineering in the emerging threats of climate change. Part blueprint, part cosmogram, the multimedia piece is an attempt to transform ecology into myth. By the mid-1980s, the Harrisons had settled into a unique niche as producers of avant-garde installations that then became policy proposals for governments and planners. Their 1985 piece Arroyo Seco release, A Serpentine for Pasadena, and its 1987 follow-up, Devil's Gate, A Refugia for Pasadena, proposed a radical for its time plan to cap the Arroyo Seco tributary of the LA River, relegating flood control to an underground passageway and opening up the surface as a nature preserve. So that's that piece. First shown at the prestigious California Institute of Technology, Arroyo Seco release had a major municipal impact, kickstarting decades of planning to redesign the Arroyo and offering the first prototype that I am aware of for remaking the river, now arguably the hottest topic in LA environmental planning. In my analysis, I trace the Harrison's narrative, aesthetic, and political strategies in their charismatic engagement with the city of Pasadena. While I also critique their planetary ambitions, which I argue overinvest in the ecology as a foundation for politics, I contend that their practice offers a fusion of artistic imagination and practical execution, striking a compelling balance between, quote, what exists and what is possible, as Michel Deserto once wrote of their work. Arroyo Seco release in Devil's Gate revealed the LA River system as a bureaucratic space as well as a space to dream. My final tributary breaks from this neo-modernist terrain of visionary artists and turns to the diverse traditions of graffiti along the river. Telling a history of graffiti is a very different task than telling a conventional art history, 
given the complex intersection between art, non-artistic expressions, crime, subculture, and the complex, uh, I'm sorry, and the shifting spatial dynamics of urban life. A genealogy of LA, graffiti, River, LA River graffiti then is a subterranean map with histories overlapping in space encoded in fragments on walls. The story of graffiti in LA is manifold. This radically diverse practice, however, plausibly began on the on, in the region on the Los Angeles River with so-called hobo graffiti around the turn of the 20th century. Enmeshed in a larger process of labor, vagrancy, and transcontinental travel, hobos improvised a sense of place along the river at the intersection of railway and, and water infrastructures. They left their pseudonyms, also called monikers or monicas, as well as dates, directional arrows, and other symbols on walls. These were waypoints on the hobo trail, which zigzagged from coast to coast. Only bits of writing remain in LA, ironically preserved on a bridge when the Army Corps channelized the LA River. The next major phase of LA graffiti also likely took root on the river when Mexican and Mexican-American kids in the early 20th century wrote their names with railroad spikes and sticks dipped in tar, drawing on the hobo toolkit. These writings, called placas or plaqueasos, informed the emerging Pachuco subculture in East LA, as well as the gangs that formed in response to hostile structural conditions. After World War II, the new so-called uh, Cholo subculture refined this wall writing and developed a singular form of Gothic script. While much could be said about the role of graffiti in East LA in defining neighborhoods and gang territories in shoring up an oppositional culture, I have limited time, so I will offer the fact that the river, once channelized, became an important site among many for gang writing, as well as the incubator for LA graffiti figurehead Chaz Bajorques, whose virtuosic style has gained renown in both graffiti and art world circles. So this is um, kind of a palimpsest of um, Cholo writing on a bridge in um, the east side of LA, and that's Bajorques. Um, painting one of his pieces, which is sort of a mix of, um, uh, you know, fine art and graffiti um, on the Arroyo Seco tributary. And that's kind of where he kind of developed his skills. More recently, since the 1980s, LA graffiti has taken cues from New York subway art, the familiar bubble letters and colorful pieces that we see today, including in, in Munich. This story intersects with an aberrant trajectory of racist policing in LA, and I recommend geographer Stefano Bloch's work if you're interested in delving further into the politics, punishment, and creative inspiration of contemporary West Coast graffiti styles. While widespread, the practice reaches an apotheosis on the LA River, with 21-year-old writer Saber's massive uh, piece from 1996, uh, which was the, considered the largest in the world at the time, um, and the graffiti crew MTA, or Metro Transit Assassins, who created an even bigger tag in the mid-aughts that became the centerpiece of a multi-jurisdictional crackdown among the LA City Council, the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, and the US Army Corps of Engineers. I look at graffiti in an environmental humanities project because I want to explore the link between green urbanism, broken windows, or so-called quality of life policing, in the revitalization of the Los Angeles River. That is the top-down articulation and enforcement of an aesthetics of natural cultural, of, er, I'm sorry. Uh, that is the top-down articulation and enforcement of an aesthetics of urban natural cultural space. Uh, this chapter concludes with an exploration of the meeting of styles, a controversial 2007 uh, graffiti festival on the Arroyo Seco as well as a close reading of the Ulysses Guide to the Los Angeles River, which is this really fascinating um, art book that is broken into two parts. Uh, the first part looks at biodiversity, and the second part looks at um, graffiti. And I mean, it's, it's really kind of like a, a choice document for my project, obviously. Um, the takeaway is twofold. First, that graffiti helps locate the stakes and imperatives 
of green urbanism from above, and second, that the LA River is constantly being made and remade, written and rewritten, anonymously or not, and everyone has a hand in it. Today, the LA River has a very different profile than when Baca and McAdams and others started their, pro their projects. Artists are still working in large numbers on the river, creating sculptures, paintings, experimental infrastructures, and community events. Developers are there too, as are planners beholden to the often, contradict to often contradictory economic, cultural, and ecological imperatives. My project focuses on art because this is where I've found the most richly imagined proposals for the Los Angeles River as a pluriversal post-capitalist commons. My aim is not just to validate art within the field of urban environmental politics, but to question the distinction between the artistic imagination and political practice, to encourage one to flow more freely uh, into the other. I've presented a lot of information here, but that is part of my point, to gesture even minimally at the abundance of vision, inspiration, and resistance required to make spaces that we can actually all share together. <laughs>